you very much for the invitation. It, it's exciting for me to hear about how the K computer is developing and also the uh, plannings for the post K era. So actually, our the work I will report on uh, started almost 10 years ago in 2000 six and was from its beginning related to the next generation supercomputing project of MEXT. This was at a time when my lab was based at the Riken Brain Science Institute, BSI in Wakoshi, and continued then when we moved in March 2011 to the uh, JSC. So I have to give special thanks to Ryutaro Himeno, Mitsuhisa Sato, and Naoya Maruyama for uh, giving us the opportunity to access the K computer since then. So at the beginning, I would like to give you an, an overview of the fundamental interactions of the nerve cells in the brain so that you have some background for the uh, rest of the story if you don't already have it. So on the left side here, there's a d depiction of uh, two coupled nerve cells and what characterizes nerve cells is that they can maintain an action an, a, a, a voltage between the inside and the outside of the cell uh, which is shown here as a function of time so that as an experimenter you can inject a current into the cell and then you will see the membrane potential increasing until the current is um, switched on and when the current is switched off the potential will fall back to its resting level. When the applied current is large enough, then the voltage can reach a threshold, and then a sharp action potential is emitted, which is only indicated here as a dash, and it's only this uh, action potential that is then actively transmitted um, to the um, target cells and will cause in the target cell a small voltage excursion, which is shown here. Now, this is called a, a postsynaptic potential, which occurs uh, with a very short uh, delay after the emission of the ac action potential in the, in, the, in the source cell. And you see already by, from the comparison of these two scales here that many of these postsynaptic potentials need to overlap in order that the target cell also can reach a spike threshold. 80% of the contacts in the brain are of this type. They are called excitatory because they are driving the membrane potential towards threshold. 20% are inhibitory because they drive the potential away from threshold. Now, this figure here is very much what an experimenter sees if a thin slice of brain is kept alive in a dish and this experiment is performed, uh, if you record the membrane potential of a nerve cell in the intact brain, the situation looks vastly different. And this is depicted here. Here you see fluctuations that basically fill all the space between the resting level and the spike threshold, and you see the occurrence of threshold crossings at apparently random times. Now, but we, what, what we now know is that this is not noise. The nerve cells basically operate as deterministic machines. So the fluctuations that you hear, here see are just the superposition of the postsynaptic potentials that, are received, that this neuron receives over its 10,000 uh, synapses. And this then results in the large fluctuations and an emission rate between one and ten spikes per second. Now there are two uh, parameters that are relevant for the um, uh, local networks in the brain. One of them I already mentioned, that a nerve cell has about 10,000 contacts with other neurons. And in the local network, the connection probability is between two cells is about 0.1. Now, the, that means that the smallest network that is required to realize both of these parameters has already 100,000 neurons. And it is in, in this respect that we uh, consider a network of 100,000 neurons as the, as the elementary unit of the, of the cortical network because it's the smallest network in which you can supply 
a neuron with, with all its synapses. And this corresponds to roughly a cubic millimeter of, of tissue, and this is also the area in which a neuron receives inputs on its um, uh, local dendrite. Now, of course, in the past, uh, people have not been able to simulate such large networks, so what is usually done is that the network is downscaled. You decide for a certain number of neurons, and then you uh, downscale the number of inputs such that the connectivity is maintained as a, at a realistic level. Now, the disadvantage then is, of course, that now the total number of synapses depends quadratically on the network size, and um, because the, these are the most numerous elements in the, in the simulation, they will determine the memory consumption. And here you see this, the memory consumptions on a, on a log log scale as a function of the number of neurons, and you see this quadratic increase in memory consumption, which looks uh, rather hopeless. But what you have to consider is that for net networks larger than 100,000 neurons, each neuron is supplied with its realistic number of synapses, meaning that from this threshold on, memory will only grow uh, linearly. And the good news is that in 2005, we have um, broken through these barriers, so we now can simulate networks with realistic um, density of connectivity. Now, a few years ago, we started to build a detailed model of a cubic millimeter of brain tissue. Um, you have to imagine that here is the surface as the, of the brain, and we are looking about a millimeter down into the depths. And what you can clearly distinguish under the microscope is that there are different layers in, in the cortex um, that have uh, different uh, cell densities and different cells. And here we were interested in the question in how, my, how far does the structure of the network determine the network activity. And for this reason, we represented the dynamics of the uh, individual neurons very simplistically, and we made them homogeneous in all the layers, and also have chosen the dynamics of the excitatory and inhib inhibitory nerve cells to be exactly identical. The only thing that distinguishes these two cells is that excitatory neurons make only excitatory synapses, inhibitory Synap neurons make only inhibitory synapses. And so when you have fixed all this, then the only thing left to specify is the connection probability, which was compiled out of um, 50 experimental papers. And then you can do simulations of, of such a network. And one of the first simulations simulation is shown here. Um, again, this is the surface of the brain. We are looking about a millimeter into the depths. And we have now plotted here time. And because the only thing that uh, matters in neural activity with respect to the interaction between nerve cells are the action potentials, so they are only here marked um, uh, by a dot because only their time of occurrence is, uh, is important. And in order to guide your eye, I have sorted the activity of excitatory and uh, inhibitory nerve cells here. Excitatory is blue, inhibitory is red. Of course, in the real brain, this would be all intermixed. And now, by just uh, looking at these uh, so-called raster display, you can observe a number of interesting things. First of all, the activity is asynchronous irregular, as it should be in the intact brain. And then you see that there is a profile of activity in, 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 uh, when you follow into the depths of, of the brain, as it is observed in experiments. And interestingly, the inhibitory neurons have a consistently higher spike rate than the excitatory ones. So this was known experimentally for a long time, but it was always attributed to the fact that inhibitory neurons are special, that they have lower thresholds, shorter time constants, and so on. Um, but I told you that here I, we have selected the neuron dynamics to be exactly identical. So here this effect is just coming out of the structure of the network, not the single neuron properties. And uh, by now, this model here is uh, used in our community as a building block for um, many other studies, and the formal model description is um, freely available uh, on the internet. Now, this uh, looks like a, a success story, but you can also say that this model is um, uh, still vastly underdetermined 
because we are representing all the local synapses, but if you look at the level of an individual neuron, then a neuron receives only 50% of its synapses from the local network and 50% of the, it receives from far away sources. And you uh, can clearly see uh, that, that something is missing. If you, for example, look at the power spectrum of the activity, then you see that the network we studied is missing all the lower components of the power spectrum. Now, and this can be explained by looking where we are in the, cortic, in, the, in the brain network. So we have described this local microcircuit here. If you move out a bit, then you see that there is um, in the larger network, which is called an area, the, the structure of the network has a space constant. The further two cells are away, the smaller the probability of connection is. But if you then move out to the brain level, you see that, for example, in the human brain, there, there, you can distinguish 100 areas, but each area is only connected to 10 others. So even at the highest level, um, there is, again, room for an interesting uh, recurrent network. And so, so, so we, we have to talk about uh, a network a net of networks, and in order to uh, arrive at a self-consistent model, we have to reach up to this scale. And this is, of course, also relevant if we want to talk to our experimental colleagues that um, um, measure brain activity with fMRI, EEG, and, and, and MEG. These are all measures on the, on the brain scale. So this means uh, we have to ask two questions. Can we do simulations at the brain scales? And do we need to simulate at full scale, or can we get away with um, diluted networks? And I will go through these uh, two questions now uh, quickly. Now, here are two papers which were um, milestones towards um, uh, reaching the brain scale. The first one from the end of 2012 uh, is uh, presenting the the step where we, where we thought that now supercomputers are really uh, usable by neuroscience because we have reached a state where you can develop your model script at your laptop, transport it to the supercomputer, and scale it up there um, uh, because all the uh, parallelization that is going on is hidden from the user. The formal model description is just a, um, a linear, um, a linear uh, um, model specification. And then at the end of um, 2014, uh, we presented a technology that showed that we can use the largest computers that were available at the time, the, the K computer and also the uh, uh, U-Queen computer in Jülich, uh, in order to uh, represent a, a network that was fulfilling all the memory of these computers so that we could show that we can engage all the memory of these machines into a single coherent simulation. And this was important in the discussion in Europe on the Human Brain Project, where the uh, idea was to, um, to build an exascale computer for this, um, for this project. And so, of course, reviewers were asking us to demonstrate that we can use the petascale machines before we are asking for, for an exascale one. And here is uh, is um, uh, a si simulation the, that we uh, the, that we presented in this in this paper. Here you see the network size simulated as a function of the number of uh, compute cores uh, involved, and you see that here networks above 10 to the power of nine neurons can be uh, achieved on on both of these uh, machines, and this. Uh, represents the largest general network simulation that uh, is, has been performed uh, today. Now, uh, you can say that uh, 10 to the power of 9 neurons is quite frustrating because it's only 1% of the size of the, of the human brain. But one has to uh, consider two things. First of all, the simulation here is a worst-case scenario. It's, it's, a, it's a gigantic random network. Uh, but of course, we assume that our brains have some structure. And um, as soon as you have structure, you can, of course, come to 
uh, more efficient representations. And second, this um, fact that we can simulate this network size here gives us hope that we can really represent the, the full human brain in terms of synapses on an, on an exascale machine. Now, in terms of the um, human brain project, there, there is a range of simulation engines uh, employed. Uh, one of them is the steps simulator by our um, colleague from the Okinawa Institute uh, of Technology, um, uh, Eric de Schütter, and our simulation software is uh, lo located here for the largest networks that still represent individual neurons um, and, and synapses in detail. And uh, this slide here shows you um, uh, a problem that is remaining. This is how stimulation time develops as the number of compute cores involved. And you see that here, for one second of biological time, both computers need about 40 minutes of wall clock time. This means that we can study the dynamics of such systems, but is, of course, not fast enough for study effects like plasticity and learning that develop over minutes and hours of, um, of biological time. So, uh, our next task here clearly is to increase the speed of these simulations by better exploiting the uh, many core systems and the multi-threading on the compute nodes. So a, a simulation like, like this is um, formulated as a self-contained benchmark application for the HPP prototype system and may also be an, an interesting uh, application for the, the um, K computer in, in terms of these uh, mini apps we talked about yesterday. So, is it necessary to simulate at the full scale? And here I brought you two experimental pictures that are showing the relationship of the activity of uh, two neurons in two different experimental tasks. This is an auditory discrimination task and this is a visual discrimination task. And what this diagram shows you is the probability that neuron 2 will be active when neuron 1 is active at time 0. This is called the cross-correlation function. And you see that this cross-correlation function is vastly different in the, same, in the two different tasks. And therefore, experimentalists like to use this measure uh, to study how uh, neurons cooperate. And unfortunately, my colleague Sascha von Alberda showed in a paper of end of last year that it is um, quite easy to downscale networks and maintaining the first order statistics of activity uh, like, like the spike rate. But when you look at second order measures of activity like the cross, -correl cross uh, correlation function I showed you, then there are severe limits that prevent you from downscaling. So it's generally, it's not possible to downscale networks while maintaining the second order statistics. And this is relevant uh, because it is the second order statistic, statistics that is driving mesoscopic measures like the local field potential and the EG. So if you get the correlation wrong, you will also get these mesoscopic measures wrong. So we have to do simulations at the full scale. Of course, not all the time, but at least to um, validate our results. Now, how can we come to self-consistent uh, brain scale models? Here, um, I, I show you how the, the number of uh, synapses is composed from uh, local ones that are part of the model, local ones that are coming from the area, and synapses that are coming from, from other areas when the area size is increased this radius here. And you see that the larger we make the model, the more of these local synapses we can represent, of course. But there's always this band here of um, 10 to 15 percent of connectivity that is representing the, the brain scale network. And in order to represent this, we set out to study a multi-area model of macaque visual cortex not because we are so much interested in, the, in vision or in the, uh, uh, in the brain of the macaque monkey, but just because there's excellent data available in the 
CocoMark database and we are already close to the human. Now, studying such a network would already mean representing roughly 10 to the power of 9 neurons. That's the number that we discussed uh, in the beginning, so this is still too large for, for practical work. Um, and therefore, as a first step, we decided to put the, just one of these cubic millimeters into all of the uh, 32 areas so that we end up with a network between 10 to the power of 6 and 10 to the power of 7 neurons. The uh, networks in the different uh, areas are slightly different in terms of their numbers of cells in the different layers, so we have to adjust this. And then we can compile the, uh, the brain scale connectivity from, the da from data that is already in this CocoMark database, uh, enhanced by data from, from recent experiments from the lab of Henry Kennedy, where they found something very important, and this is what they call the exponential distance rule, that uh, tells us that the density of connectivity uh, de declines with the distance of areas. And this allows us to interpret this matrix here um, quantitatively and then come, come up with a joint first draft matrix of the brain scale connectivity. And this is then uh, just some uh, clustering on the resulting um, brain scale connectivity and it brings out functional circuits that we um, know from studies of activity, and these, these is, are the, the ventral and the dorsal stream in the, in the visual cortex, showing you that our um, connecti connectivity matrix is not uh, completely crazy, but has some functional relations. And now, of course, we can also do simulations, and we uh, observe a number of interesting things. For example, that the activity in the different layers is differently structured. The higher you go, the more irregular it becomes and the more synchrony um, you see. And most importantly, if we compare the, uh, what is called the functional connectivity, so the cross-correlation of activity between areas in, in the simulation with experimental data, here sorted according to the experimental data, then you see that, that these matrices are already uh, similar. Of course, there are also differences. And if you uh, study how similar they, are, they actually are, then you discover that, that the um, simulated activity is closer to the experimental, experimentally measured activity than, the, than if you would just compare the anatomical matrix with the experimental activity. So, so this shows that the, our simulated activity really adds something um, to the model. And of course, you can also study how activity is propagating uh, in, the, in the brain. This is shown here when we map the activity back on the outline of the, um, uh, of the brain of the monkey. So, and in the last minutes, uh, I would um, like to introduce you something that we have uh, recently done, in, and, and this is a new type of interaction which is called uh, gap junctions, and this is the fact that cells can be uh, electrically uh, coupled, uh, by, that can be uh, represented like a, by a resist, resistance here, and this is of course um, a, a, a severe problem because that basically means that the um, the set of differential equations that is describing the individual neurons is now collapsing into one uh, gigantic system, and the result is that only very small networks have been studied so far. And last year, um, together with our colleagues in Japan, we were able to present a technology that is um, over overcoming this, and the, the result is already contained in version 2.10 of, of NEST, and we are presently uh, uh, benchmarking these, um, this new simulation te technology together with Itaro Kitayama and Brian Wiley, who will speak after me. And the, the way we achieve this is that we are not communicating every time step, but that we are dis 
communicating only in the minimal delay that is required by the spiking interaction I showed in the beginning of the talk and are representing the membrane potential time course in between by a cubic interpolation and then uh, iterate this, um, this min delay as long as we achieve the required accuracy. And this whole scheme is more efficient than uh, stepping forward in this uh, micro steps. And then the uh, benchmark data um, so far show that if we are not using gap junctions, we have no loss in performance as, uh, as in the situation before. And in a weak scaling scenario, we can move up to moderately sized networks that are probably sufficient because gap junctions only couple neurons that are close by. So in summary, I have argued for the need for brain scale models to increase self-consistency and to be able to compute meso and macroscopic measures of activity. I also argued for the need for full-scale models um, because the second order statistics is irreducible and to verify uh, mean field results. The machines we have today are ready for use by neuroscience. And we have shown that the K-computer and your queen are well suited for brain scale simulations. And in the last part of the talk, I showed you some initial neuroscience results for a model of the macaque monkey visual cortex and introduced a new biological mechanism called gap junctions or electrical synapses that is also now uh, available in our simulation software. This is a hard problem because it requires time continuous interactions and is presently evaluated in the context of our <coughs> memorandum of understanding be between AICS and Jülich. Thank you.